Beautiful hymn, which should be a, uh, a, a national anthem to each and every one of us, the daily walk. First Kings, chapter 3, starting at verse 5, and we'll go through the end of the chapter. First Kings, chapter 3, verse 5, through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. By night, and God said, said, Ask what shall I give you? And Solomon said, You have shown great mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him, and you have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father David. For I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked these things, this thing. Then God said to him, Because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the, the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there, is, that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if you're walking, so if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Then Solomon awoke, and indeed it had been a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, and made a feast for all his servants. Now two women who were harlots came to the king, and stood before him. And one woman said, O oh my Lord, this woman and I dwell in the same house, and I have given birth while she was in the house. Then it happened the third day after I had given birth that this woman also gave birth, and we were together. No one was with us in the house except the two of us in the house. And this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. So she arose in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while your maidservant slept and laid him in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. And when I rose in the morning to nurse my son, there he was, dead. But when I had examined him in the morning, indeed, he was not my son whom I had born. Then the other woman said, No, but the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. And the first woman said, No, but the dead one is your son, and the living one is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. And the king said, The one says, This is my son who lives, and your son is dead, is the dead one. And the other says, No, but your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. Then the king said, Bring me, my, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to one and half to the other. Then the woman whose son was living spoke to the king, for she yearned with compassion for her son. And she said, O my Lord, give her the living child, and by no means kill him. But the other said, Let him be neither mine nor yours, but divide him. So the king answered and said, 
give the first woman the living child, and by no means kill him. She is his mother. And all Israel heard the judgment which the king had rendered, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to administer justice. Please be seated. Again, we welcome everyone to the services here at Chalmette. We do have those that are visiting. We are glad that you're here. And we do ask that you take an attendance card that's in the back of the pew and just please fill that out and place it in the collection plate as it's passed a little bit later uh, in the services. And I also wanted to mention that Debbie, that's been coming a few times and been having uh, studies with her, uh, she fell last night, and that's the reason she's not here this morning, banged herself up. And, uh, but the, do have a study still set with her for tomorrow, so I'd like for you to pray for that since it's there at the house. She won't have to leave or anything, uh, able to do that. So we're, we're work, working with her. And also like for you to remember the couple that lost the one-year-old child. I'll be counseling with them again tomorrow night at, uh, and working with them. And then they, they contacted me again when I was in Indiana. And, you know, of course, wanting counseling then, but I was out of town. But we do have it set again for tomorrow night. So pray that those things will uh, go well. We know that the fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So, so let's pray fervently for the things that we need to be praying for. And uh, this morning in the class, our classroom got to be the first ones to sing happy birthday to Linda. So we were the first ones on the list. This morning, we want to look at Solomon and the requests that he made. You know, we read in Romans 15, verse 4, that the things of, that were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So we need to learn for those things that were written before we ever came on the scene. And we have a wonderful uh, sermon here that uh, comes from the uh, study of Solomon. And Solomon takes control, and that's found in the passages that Butch read for us. I'm not going to read all those passages again, but uh, keep them in mind when you go through this and you see the wisdom of Solomon. And, you know, from the very start, Solomon had opposition. His brother Adonijah, if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, I don't, if I don't look, at, look up the names, I have trouble with those names, but his brother wanted to take the kingdom. And it was going to be Solomon's Bathsheba and Nathan, the prophet, went to David before he died and requested that Solomon be made king. And indeed, David made him king before he died. But Adonijah, still, you know, men want power, don't they? That's something that you see in so many places, uh, that men will do almost anything to have power. No, I like watching, and my family likes watching some of those kind of uh, uh, Dateline and 2020 and shows like that, Forensic Files, those type of shows. And you see that people will do a lot of things for money and for power. But you know, sometimes that even happens in the church. Somebody's trying to have power in the church. Power belongs to God, and all the glory goes to him. But Solomon found a way to kind of let Adonijah, his brother, live. But he also had other adversaries. You remember that, uh, that Joab actually turned against him as well. And one of the priests that aided him, Abathar, also joined in with uh, Joab and turned against Solomon. Now, notice this. Anytime that you stand for what's right, we're going to have opposition. There'll be those that want to take you down for doing what is right. This is going to be Solomon's kingdom to have, appointed by David. But David has Abathar, that priest, you know, he's not spared. He is put to death for what he does. We need to understand that there is a great price to pay when we don't serve God as we should. When we try to take things to ourselves that really don't belong to us, we're going to pay a price. Remember King Herod. He wanted the glory. Look what I have done. And remember the worms they did. And we see when men try to take what belongs to God, it doesn't work out so well. Rather, we should learn a lesson from that. Today, when we serve God according to his will, what he's given us in his word, then we will prosper. 
But at any point in our lives, when we try to do things according to our own will, then God will bring us down. It will, become, it will be brought to naught. Brethren, let's serve the Lord faithfully then, not doing what men would have us to do, not fighting for some kind of position, but looking to the Lord. Lord, here am I, send me. Lord, what would you have me to do? I want to serve you faithfully in all my life. But now, notice, and something I think sometimes people forget, God came to Solomon in a, in a dream and told him what to ask for. Now, we can credit Solomon with asking what God told him in a dream to ask for. But now it must be pointed out that God does not speak to us today through dreams. We may have dreams, but that's not God speaking to us. Some people think, well, I had a dream and this happened, and therefore God wants me to do something. No, that's not how God speaks to us today. We read in verse 5 of our text, and in Gibeon, the Lord appeared unto Solomon, notice, in a dream by night. And Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So God was speaking to him in this way, and he tells him, here's what you, what you need. Here's what's more important, wisdom rather than riches and gold. But now we think back. Here's Solomon, who was really raised and brought up, you know, being the king's son. He would have had all sorts of things, anything that he wanted, he would have had it. You know, he really had a father. Now, he had his weaknesses at times. We know, we know those weaknesses because they're recorded in the pages of the Bible for us. But as a whole, he had a father that you serve God. And at least at the beginning, Solomon starts with, uh, with a good start. He starts serving God as he should. But like so many people, he drifted away from what he should. But he came back and, and, and we understand what the conclusion of the matter is. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. So we see that. We see what is important to, to man. And God told Solomon, here's what you need to do. Brethren, here's what we need to do. Sometimes in our lives, we are seeking to have great riches. God, make me some, something great. Do this with my life. If you're serving God as a child of God, you are doing something that's wonderful. You are doing something that's great. And think of what God has laid in store for us after this life is over. Think about when we do get to hear that trumpet sound and we see the Lord descend from heaven and we get to go be with him there forever and ever. And as Jesus said, I go and prepare a mansion for you. And he also says that where I am there, ye may be also. Brethren, we need to think of what God wants us to be seeking as well. Solomon, he sought for wisdom rather than great riches, but God gave him that as well, didn't he? See, God will take care of us when we do what God tells us to do. Remember what Jesus said in, in Matthew chapter 6. He talked about all those things that man has need of, food, clothing, raiment, but he, he came to the conclusion. Seek all those things. Uh, don't seek all those things. He said, seek first to the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Sometimes people spend a lifetime chasing after things. Now, it's good to get an education. It's, it's good to know certain things that we can have a good job. But brethren, understand the most important thing that we will ever do is serve God Almighty. And when we serve him, we are doing something that makes a difference in life that will last into eternity. Those other things, they're not going to matter after our death. Well, how many accolades did, did, did I have? That won't matter. But did I serve God? That will matter. That will make a difference. And in reality, right now, we're preaching our own funeral. Not the guy that stands in some pul pulpit when we're dead. Really, we're preaching our own fu funeral right now. But we see that God also spoke to Moses and uh, different people, Daniel and uh, Joseph, through dreams. You know, one person even spoke to, to uh, through a dream. It may surprise you, but you, if you stop and think about it, Nebuchadnezzar. And that man was an evil man. I mean, that man was evil at, the, at that time. But God spoke to him, and he opened his eyes, didn't he? Again, God does not speak to us 
in dreams, but God does speak to us through his word. That's the only way that God will speak to man. You have God speaking through the Holy Spirit through this word that was inspired. Brethren, know the word. Know the word of God. It will guide you into heaven. It will guide you in your daily life. It will guide you how to be a good husband, how to be a good wife, how to be a good neighbor, how to be a good employee, how to be a good employer. Ask for the wisdom that God has. We must pray for that wisdom. And first we have to have knowledge. First you have to have knowledge. Then wisdom is knowing how to use that knowledge that you have. Sometimes knowledge can be misused. You know, even the word of God can be misused. We must use it properly. First know the word and then ask that God would give us the wisdom to use it wisely. And let's teach it to others and let's live it. We see this in Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2. God, who at sundry at times and in divers manners spake in the past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us. How? Unto us with his Son. And we have the word of Jesus. What was in the prophets? We don't follow that anymore. It's for our learning, as we notice. But we follow the words of Jesus. And notice what Solomon was told in verse 7 of that text in 1 Kings 3, it says, I am but a little child. You know what that indicates? And this is in the, pre- in the, in the dream now. Guidance. We need to be praying for guidance. Here's, here's a man. Here's Solomon. Here, here's a king. And we know that he has, he's going to have more wisdom than anybody before him, anybody after him. There's none like Solomon But now there's something that we we must understand. Guidance. We need guidance through the word of God. Brethren, we can't do it by ourselves, can we? We must live according to God's word. And you you know also something that indicates that means we must humble ourselves. That we would follow God and not do our own will. And man has trouble with that, doesn't he? Because of pride it stands in the way. I want to do things my way. And we live in a society that says and does that. Do things your own way. Enjoy all things while you're here. You only live once. But brethren, we actually continue to live after we leave this body. So therefore, seek those things that are above, not those things that are on on this earth. We must humble ourselves as as a child and know who it is that is our Father. Now, we only have two choices. And you have to make sure which one you're going to pick from. Are you going to follow the world and follow Satan? Are you going to humble yourselves and follow God and do what God wants you to do? You know, it does make a a lot of difference. And he also wanted God to to guide him. And now that indicates something else that's important. Very important. He gave God the credit. Give God the credit. It's not what we have done. it's, It's not... Look how good I am. And sometimes that happens with, uh, with people in the body of Christ, doesn't it? They want to talk about what they've done. Brethren, everything that we do, any soul that we can lead to Christ, it should be giving glory to God and not to man. Because it is God that deserves the glory. God is the one that created this universe. God is the one that created everything that we have and so we should be giving credit to God and not living like the world question question can people see in us that we live differently than the world or do we blend in so much with the world that they can't tell a difference in us and the rest of the world a child of God lives differently not that he has to say that he does it will come out just by the way that you live people will know and brethren, we, have, we must give that credit to God where it belongs. But we also see that wisdom is de- demonstrated. We see later in, in the passage, you know, when those two harlots came, you know, with one, one child had died, Solomon showed great wisdom. You know, he, he, he knew which one it was by the question that he asked and the response. Now, so, notice something here. And we would do well to learn this fact Solomon first listened. Rather than maybe that's the reason that God gave us two ears and one mouth. And we ought to be, we ought to be using some wisdom to understand that. Learn to, uh, learn to listen. Let me tell you something. 
Now, as far as counseling, you know, I mentioned counseling that couple. I'll never hang a shingle out that says, you know, a counselor. You know what? The best thing you can do when you're talking with anybody in some situation. Now, there are going to be some things you will say. But, you know, the number one thing is listen. Listen to what they've got to say. And you'll learn a lot. And a lot of times that's what people need. They need somebody to listen. Not somebody that thinks they have all the answers. God has the answers, doesn't he? You know, how are you going to overcome this difficulty, God? I, I can't save you. God can. Now, you know, if we'll use the, the knowledge and the, the knowledge that we have and then use wisdom, we can, through the word of God, lead them to Jesus Christ, can't we? But the glory and the honor goes to God. Notice in 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. We just a little bit further on. It says, and God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding. Notice, exceedingly much and largeness of heart, even as, that, as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men, than Etham, the Ezerite, and Heman, the and also Dardo, the sons of Mahola, and his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Look at the wisdom of Solomon. But when did he do all this? When he listened to God. Notice what God can do with our lives. God can do something with your life if you will let him. If you will let God be in control and not try, try to take the ham, not try to take the lead, but be in control yourself. Uh, 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 let God be in control of you and do what God wants us to do. Question comes again. Have I turned my life completely over to God? Solomon at this point, he's not holding something back. He completely gave his life to God. Understand something. You can't give your life partially to God. It won't work. God desires and expects and deserves all of us, not part of us. You can't give part-time service to God and get full-time benefits. It doesn't work that way. And then we also notice 1 Kings 4, verse 34. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from the kings of, of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. And then we see also about the queen of Sheba in 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 6 through 8. And she said to the, to the king, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land of, thy, of thine acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not the words until I came, and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. Happy are, the, are thy men, happy are these thy servants which, that, which stand continually before thee and they hear thy wisdom. Those that serve Solomon were happy to be his servants. Now why? Why were they happy? Because Solomon was ruling in the way that God wanted him to. He was not trying to cause oppression upon them. He was Doing what God wanted him to do. You know, that's the kind of leaders that we need in all lands. Those that will follow God. And brethren, the Bible even tells us to pray for our leaders. We must pray for them that they would see the need to guide and use the wisdom that God can only give. Brethren, when we do that, we will have a different world, won't we? We will have different members of the body of Christ. We will have different elders, different deacons, because they want to do, do what God has said. They want to fulfill the role that God has given them. Preachers will want to preach only the word of God and give all glory unto him because that is what God deserves. And all members will want to serve God with all their heart, with all their being, and not look on service to God as something that you can take it or leave it, but that you must do it. But it says all, all his servants were happy to be his servants. He used wisdom. He was not a tyrant. He knew what he was doing. Then we see in Ephesians 5 verses 15 through 17. See then that you walk circumspectly. Notice this. 
not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. If you don't know what the will of the Lord is, God says you're walking as fools. And if you do know what the word of the Lord is and you're not serving him faithfully, God says you're walking as fools. That's not coming from any man. That's coming from the word of God. That was given by inspiration. If you're not wa walking and using what God has given you and knowing his will and walking according to it, God says you're walking as a fool. You don't want to be in that side in the sight of God, somebody that lives that way. And going back to the Old Testament in Proverbs 9, verse 20, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. There's where we get true wisdom. There's where we get true knowledge. What is it that you want to know most about? Well, I've got this degree and that degree, and I can do this and I can do that, you know, and so what? Do you serve God faithfully? That's what matters, isn't it? That's what matters. Not that I can do this and I can do that. In 1 Corinthians 3 verses 18 through 20 it says, Let no man deceive himself. Notice that, deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool. Why? That he may be, be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. What the wise people in this world think that they're doing. He says it's, fool, it's fools that they're doing. Usually they call, call them college professors. Because they think they know more than God does. And they don't. Those people are fools in most of our universities teaching our young people. There is no God, and don't you dare mention him. And even one of my own students in class this morning, sitting right here, said my teacher didn't want my Bible, didn't want me to have my Bible in class. That's right here in, in where we live, brethren. Though God says those people are fools. That's not Mark speaking. That's what God's word says. Those people are as fools. Now we need to learn the source of wisdom. Proverbs 2, 6 says, for the Lord giveth wisdom out of his mouth, cometh knowledge and understanding. And in James verse 1, verse 5, it says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and embraceth not, and it shall be given him. Are you praying for wisdom from God? Are you, are you seeking knowledge from the word of God and then asking God the wisdom to go out and use it properly? And in James also, we see chapter 3, verse 17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable. Remind you of Solomon. And gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. That's what true wisdom does. It doesn't, it doesn't blow up itself and look at me, look at my accomplishments. No, it humbles himself before the mighty throne of God. And in 2 Timothy 3, verse 15, we know that all scripture is given, given by God, by his inspiration. Brethren, that's the word we need to know. You want to truly have knowledge in this world? Right, here's the knowledge that you need. And there's a famine in the land. There's a famine for this word because it, people just don't know the word of God like they should. And we also read in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 through 8, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, not, nor of the, of the princes of the world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even though his hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world do. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They thought they were doing God a favor when they put Jesus Christ on the cross because they didn't know the word of God. They should have known from over 300 prophecies that he was coming. They should have known from the miracles that he did when he raised the dead, healed the sick. This is, this is the Christ. But they said he was a, a liar and they put him on the cross. 
because they didn't believe him. Oh, that's, that's the foolishness of men, isn't it? And then we also see this in 1 Kings 3, verse 14. When we serve God, we will not be separated from him as long as we serve him. Yes, God knows that we have our shortcomings. But God also knows and tells us that if we'll serve him with all of our heart, he will bless us. Brethren, I have a question for you this morning. Start with, do you know the word of God? How well, and several questions we have. How well do you know the word of God? This kind of somewhat, somewhat's going to get you in trouble. You need to know what the word of God is. I want you to think about this, and I hope this doesn't describe you. But I'm afraid a lot of members of the church, churches of Christ could not give book, chapter, and verse for the plan of salvation. That is sad. I hope that, that's not the way with you. But, you know, that's actually the beginning. Do you know what the Bible says about how to live your life daily? How to live in your home? How to live on your jobs? How to conduct yourself? Do you love the Lord with all your heart? Is God the first thing in your life? Or is he somewhere else down the list? Are you serving God with all of your heart? Doesn't God deserve all of our service? All that we have? We don't, God doesn't deserve second place. God doesn't deserve to, to serve him partially some of the time. Is that how we look at God? That I can, you know, I can take him this Sunday, next Sunday. Hey, I may skip. And, you know, what, what's the difference? Wednesday night, hey, you know, there's a program I like to watch on Wednesday night, so I'll stay home and watch it or I'm tired. How much do we love God? How much do we sacrifice? You know, we, we bow our heads and we ask for God's blessings. How much are we willing to give back and from us? Do, do, do we just want God? God, you give. I'll keep taking. What's, what's our life like? We, we need to look at our lives, don't we? Am I serving God? Sol Solomon was wise because he listened to God and he kept God's word. Can the same be said of us today? You know, how to become a child of God, how to become a Christian. Oh, so many would ridicule it, but it still stands true today. Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You want to take that word and obey it or the words of men. But there's more to it than that. That's, how, that's, that's the start. You know, Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you. Acts 2, verse 38. But then it talks about, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They didn't, well, I was baptized, I'll go my way. No, it says they continued steadfastly. Are we doing that? Are we continuing? And they went house to house with their brethren. They sought to teach the word of God. That's talking about their, their everyday living. Not just every now and then. They gave their all to God. They made a commitment when they were baptized. And they're going to live up to that commitment. This morning, 